so who are you and what do you do? My name is Professor Hugo de Garros. I'm, formerly I was a, a professor of brain building, building artificial brains. I'm now fairly recently retired. I'm based in China. Uh, the work I'm doing now is looking into the possibility of the existence of uh, a, a femtotech, or as I call it, Fermi tech. That's a technology based on physical phenomena that I'm trying to research at the moment. So that a femtometer technology would become possible. Before that, I was director of the artificial brain lab in Xiamen. That's a city on the coast, southeast coast of China. So I live in China. And my role has recently been taken over by Professor Ben Goetzel, who's a well-known name in this community. So he'll, he'll be trying to fulfill his dream of AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. My approach to building artificial brains was evolutionary engineering. So, so I would evolve neural networks very fast in, in the latest hardware, as quickly as possible. Evolve them in seconds, literally and then put tens of thousands of them together, connect them up in interesting ways according to the architectures of, I call them human BAs, brain architects. So uh, ben, ben and I are trying to persuade the Chinese government to invest heavily in artificial brains technology because, well, for example, by 2020, roughly, the Korean government promises, more or less, to put a home robot, so artificial brain-based, controlled robot, in virtually every Korean household in 10 years. And Bill Gates is on record saying that by about 2030, it's a mere 20 years away, uh, the home robot industry will be one of the biggest and richest in the world. And that makes sense if you think about it, because uh, how much money would you be prepared to pay for a genuinely useful, intelligent home robot that could, for example, take the dog for a walk or wash the dishes, clean the house, wash the clothes? You know, a genuinely useful robot. And most people say that that would be so useful, they would be prepared to spend more money than for a car. Right? So a lot of money. So this, this would be a huge industry. Now, what this, uh, this program is about is the longer term consequences of this industry and the rise of artificial intelligence in general. So um, the scenario I see is the most plausible, the most realistic is that you know, in the 2020s there, there will be artificial brain based home robots that will be very common. There'll be lots of, lots of other applications as well. But this will be the one that really talks to most people. It'll, it'll be like the, the means for the masses to become conscious of a, of a growing problem. And what is that problem? Well, let's give it a label. Call it species dominance issue. In other words, as these machines get smarter and smarter and smarter, then uh, people will start worrying, right? Like, Im imagine, well, <laughs> we're all familiar with Moore's law, so, well, for those who aren't, Moore is a person, Gordon Moore. He's still alive. I think he's in his 80s now. He's pretty old. But in the mid-60s, he noticed a trend in electronics, and that is that the, the electronics industry was cramming ever more transistors onto a single chip. And in fact, the number, that number that you could put into the chip was doubling roughly every year and a half or so. So Moore noticed this trend, and so this trend has now been labelled Moore's Law. And it's been valid for, what, mid-60s, uh, what's that, 45 years, right? So common sense is if you take any number and you multiply it by two, by two, by two, by two, by two, you end up with a huge number. So today, today's chips, and by today is 2010, in today's chips, you have billions of transistors on a single chip. Now, that trend will continue at least for another decade or so, and 
you know, people have been saying, oh, Moore's Law is going to run out you know, by a given date, and they get it wrong. <laughs> it just keeps going. So it looks as though you know, human engineering, human ingenuity will keep finding ways to, to extend Moore's Law ever longer. But if you extrapolate the trend to about 2020, so 10 years away, then you're putting a single bit of information on one atom. Right? So, uh, well, let me, I've got a, a plastic bottle of orange juice here. So if I ask you, how many atoms in, in this bottle of orange juice? So how many bits, if, if you have one bit per atom? And the answer is, in anything that's sort of handheld object, uh, if you've done any chemistry from high school, you'll know that the, the number of atoms is roughly Avogadro's number. And that's, that's a trillion, trillion atoms. So a trillion, trillion bits. Okay? So that's, that's 10 to the power 24. That's a 1 and 24 zero. So it's a million, 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 million atoms or bits. Now, if technology is giving us that capacity by around 2020, how fast could, could one atom switch, switch its state from you know, zero to one? It's a bit, right? And the answer is about a femtosecond. Well, how, how fast is that? Well, it's about a thousandth of a trillionth, so 10 to the minus 15 of a second. It's incredibly fast. So imagine then, in 2020, this, this orange juice has been nanotech. I mean, it's been... You know, 2020 technolo technologized to the point where every atom in here is functioning as a, a computer component, imagine. Okay. So what's the computing capacity then of this handheld object, this, this bottle of orange juice? And the answer is, well, you can work it out. How many atoms? Well, trillion, trillion, that's 10 to the 24. And each atom is switching, let, let's say roughly 10 to the 16, so what's that? 10,000 trillion times a second. That's each atom. And, yet, and you've got a trillion, trillion atoms. Okay? So do the math, you just multiply those two numbers, and you get 10 to power 40. That's the technology that's coming, right? In a mere 10 years. 10 to power 40. Bit flips. It flips per second. All right. Now ask yourself a similar question. What's the equivalent computing capacity of the human brain? How do you how do you calculate that? Well, you can estimate it fairly easily, fairly quickly. Uh, how many brain cells do we have in our brains? About hundred billion, more or less. So that's that's ten to the power eleven. Okay. And each brain cell, or neuron, as they're called, connects, makes a connection, physical connection to about roughly, let's say, 10,000 others. So that's 10 to the 4. And each connection, there's a technical word for that connection between two brain cells, it's called a synapse. So each synapse can signal at roughly maximum, say, 10 bits per second. So that's 10 to the 1. So how many bits is all that together? So multiply those three numbers. So 10 to the 11, that's 100 billion brain cells, times 10 to the 4, that's roughly how many connections per brain cell, times 10 to the 1, how many bits per second per synapse. You work that out, it's roughly 10 to the power 16. 11 plus 4 plus 1. Okay. 10 to the power 16. But can you remember... <laughs> How many bits this was, the machine? 10 to the power 40. Okay? So human brain, 10 to the power 16. This, the, the orange juice, 10 to the power 40. Now that is a trillion, trillion times more than our human brain. So the physicist in me sees the writing on the wall. It's only a question of time before humanity, sooner or later, is confronted with this enormous question, do we allow our machines, 
our artificial intellects. I call them artelects, just for short. So an artelect is a portmanteau word, a you know, shortening of two words. Artificial intellects. So these artelects could become trillion, trillion times superior to us in their computing capacity. Now you may say, well, flipping a lot of bits is not the same thing as high intelligence. Right? And that's true. You, you need something else as well. And that is you need a knowledge of how our brains become intelligent. What, what, what's going on in our brains that makes us intelligent? And the answer is, well, we have to have the appropriate neural circuitry. Now, we don't have that today, not yet. I mean, it's, it, that knowledge is coming fast. And again, Moore's law is creating uh, new tools to, to help us understand how the, how, how the brain works. So we can take that knowledge from neuroscience and put it into the neuroengineering. So then we can have these artificial brains becoming more and more similar to real brains, our own human brain, and speeding up the whole process by a factor of a million. Because our brains, our brain cells, they communicate at chemical speeds maximum about I know, 100 meters a second. But an electronic brain would communicate at the speed of light. Right? That's, that's about a million times faster. So imagine a machine of human intelligence studying a PhD. It would be a million times faster. That's like a PhD in what? couple of minutes. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it, 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 it almost sounds like a joke today. It sounds, sounds like science fiction, but it's coming. So if you take the issue seriously, if, if humanity decides to put these machines um, on the plate, so to speak, if, if we create them, then we have a major problem. You're, yeah, you're going to sleep. Can 